surfaces, it has expanded this this concept. Is there any are there any cases where voice over IP is being restricted, or where that restricts consumers in any way? Isn't that the open option for most consumers? I, uh, I don't know that I understand the question exactly, but voice well, let me, is. Let me just try and then before I can go wondering, if, let me try and clarify a little bit. Um, since we're talking about um, now uh, potentially expanding this to, I think you would say, mobile devices of, of any kind, then that's wire, really, wireless. excuse me, wireless, yeah, I guess wireless. mobile devices. Um, that there may not be any limits on that. Is there any other way of, of restricting that concept? And I'm trying to understand how your mention of voice over IP as uh, changing the concept of what is a, a mobile communication device, uh, how that fits in to how we might be able to, to figure out how to tailor or craft an appropriate exemption should one issue. I think I was uh, trying to convey that technology is changing and uh, voice data or video <coughs> is all digits in the, in the IP world. And in 3G, uh, whether it's voice over inter internet protocol or um, you know, you know, traditional analog, uh, Translation, it it's all the same, and uh, and a, whatever device it is, if it's a wireless device conveying information over X's and O's, ones and twos, um, whether it carries a voice or it carries an image or, or something else, it is in the IP world is really irrelevant, and and that's why I suggested changing it to wireless devices because wireless devices do uh, all those things and they're going to continue and technology will continue to to to, to march on so to speak um, that's why the suggestion of wireless device if if, if you say a wireless telephone uh, what do you see in your, what's the first vision that comes to mind it's not the old uh, what would say the Carter phone the, the black phone setting are you you think of a you might think of a of a phone that, uh, or maybe a flip phone, or a phone that you pull out that's maybe an iPhone. But a wireless device uh, will mature into uh, a nine inch uh, phone, uh, or uh, a tablet, or, a, or an iPad, or, and, and all those things are, are communication devices. So that would be a more traditional thought process of what is a wireless device that you communicate with. That's why I suggest uh, uh, you, know, you might want to, to change the, uh, the words to clearly identify where the majority of people are going with wireless devices. Any thoughts on that? The short answer is none that you haven't heard before. The longer answer is there is nothing in the record supporting a demonstration of harm or need or non infringing use with respect to such devices. And um, while we're on the topic of harm, I, if I understand <coughs> correctly, that uh, because at least when, when uh, the circumvention relates to, based on the current exemption, uh, relate, relates to individual uh, consumers, it's I believe I heard you said that there there has not been uh, any any specific harm for the exemption that's existed the last three years with uh, with respect to uh, the cellular carriers. I don't think I said that. What I think I said was that there was no demonstration of cognizable. either in this record or frankly three years ago but I don't think I addressed the question of whether the exemption has caused harm to the industry I think that's actually the wrong focus the question is whether the funds have carried their burden of demonstrating harm 
Well, assuming uh, for a minute that uh, we think that uh, they did prove their burden, and considering the fact that there has been a, an exemption in existence, um, to what uh, do you have any knowledge or any information you can provide as to harm that has been caused by the existing exemption? Uh, the continued citation combined to the scope that uh, it, during the, for the current exemption. So is there any particular reason, given that the proposed scope that you offer seems to uh, be limited, where, where it's limited to owners and there's an argument that no one is actually an owner of the software uh, uh, on a device and Maybe that's, that's an issue based on the current language, too, because that, that uh, was based on Section 117 at a time when we had less clarity of, uh, of contracts and pre-Werner uh, decisions. Is there any reason, given the fact that there has been no harm under the current language, why there is a need to uh, limit that scope uh, further? Well, these are the question of owner of the copy of the computer program, we're not changing, proposing a change from the existing scope. That's in the current exemption, and we're not, we're, we're simply suggesting that it stay. Okay. We, we, we are adding the individual customer Let me pick up on that last point. Uh, I know you made the point that uh, commercial activity isn't really something that this is all about. I'm, I'm not sure whether I agree it, but I agree with that. But I, I invite you to elaborate, and then I'd like to sort of flip the question and say, why should we care about commercial activity as opposed to acts taken simply by an individual owner of a cell phone who wants to be able to use it on another network? Uh, so first, Bruce, why, why, why is the fact that an activity might be commercial disqualify it from being a non-infringing use that we need to pay attention to? I don't think that's the argument, though. Okay. The argument that I'm making is that the <coughs> primary basis that is advanced by the other side, first of all, I don't think the other side is carrying its burden, even as to individuals, but the primary argument that is advanced by the other side relates to the needs of individuals, and we are trying to be accommodating to that. We are also recognizing as a factual matter expect CTIA members to go after the individual customers who would do this, uh, who would circumvent using Section 1201. That's the reason that we are limiting the proposed exemption to individual customers. Okay, but I, I didn't really, I really wasn't talking about necessarily just what you were, you were putting out as, as an alternative exemption. I, I think throughout your comments you talk about how this rulemaking is not supposed to get into the enabling of commercial activities. And I, I'm not sure I take that from the language of the statute. I'm not sure I even take it from the legislative history, although I think you do. So it's an opportunity for you to expound on that. Well, we do take it from the legislative history. If you look at the, the reason that this was included, it was primarily to uh, validate concerns about individual fair use. And if you look, for example, at the factors that are identified in the statute, Two of them, about the four, go to core fair use type issues. Uh, so uh, our belief is that when Congress put this entire proceeding in, it came in the Congress Committee, as you'll recall, the concern was over limitations on individuals and other individual uses and other traditional fair uses. But it's often 
but it's not in cases finding fair use. The use actually is commercial. So it, it's not it's not as though, in fact, we're talking about fair use means it's got to be non-commercial. Well, I understand that, but I don't believe those are the types of cases that animated the Commerce Committee. You know, if you look at the history of the debates leading up to the introduction of this section, the concerns that animated the Commerce Committee were socially beneficial, non-commercial fair uses. And I think we make those arguments Let me put it to you folks a little differently. I, I think if you look at what the register's recommendations in the last two rulemakings have focused on, they've certainly focused on the individual and the need of the individual owner of a cell phone uh, to be able to switch to another network um, if he or she so desires. Um, so that's been our focus. Um, your focus is a bit broader. So uh, I guess. Well, I guess what I ask you to do is justify why we need to be so concerned about commercial actors who might want to make a buck out of uh, being able to uh, do things that in some cases perhaps might be more within the scope of Section 1201A2 than 1201A1? Well, uh, specifically, I don't think I'm asking for that uh, ex expansion. Okay. Uh, 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 basically, it's, uh, we've suggested solely for the purpose of connecting with another wireless communication. <coughs> wireless network so uh, you know I'm I, I don't think that our position was a massive expansion of, uh, of, of that from a solely for the purposes of connecting to, a, to another network so I, um, I, I, I do think that uh, in reference to the to the, to the harm uh, I think you clearly have a record of the benefits that accrue to this specific exemption and were you not to have the exemption, then all those benefits go away, uh, creating um, you know harm. Um, to to Bruce's point, I, I think the record is replete with with that issue, and I think that his particular definition that he's proposing is is more of a, a Trojan horse uh, that uh, you cannot uh, fully utilize uh, an exemption under the terms and conditions that not only he's, he's stated today in his testimony, but uh, uh, specifically if you look at his exemption, uh, it is a, a ratcheting down, if not a, a further restriction of an individual individual's right uh, to, to full use and non-infringing use of uh, a handset. So um, I, I think that uh, sort of the burden of proof may uh, shift again back to someone who is asking you to to modify the definition, uh, and I don't particularly see any information in the record that supports his definition as as a fair and accurate uh, uh, rewrite and that the, the office should uh, consider. Okay, I want to follow up on that point, but first of all, anything else on commercial uses? Sure, I just wanted to uh, refer to the example that we provided in our proposal of the individual consumer who has long-term service, a long-term service contract with a post-paid service provider, has a device that he or she is perfectly happy with, and um, when the time comes up, it, that person is, is presumably paying an elevated monthly service charge every month to cover the cost of providing devices at low upfront cost to that person or anyone else who accepts a long-term contract. So when the, when the time comes up for that person to sign a new contract and to, uh, to get a so-called subsidized device in return for signing a new contract, or to just continue um, with the service month to month, continuing to pay the elevated service fee, either way, if that person sticks with that service, he or she is going to be paying the elevated monthly service charge that uh, that contemplates the purchase, the, the, the investment that the company makes in providing a low cost so-called subsidized device to consumers. So that person should be able to um, get a device from by, in exchange for signing a new contract. And if he or she does not want to switch from their old device, then they should be able to, to sell it. And, uh, I mean, I think that that was, that was the very limited sort of something that I suppose you could call expressly commercial um, uh, 
purpose that we had contemplated. But aside from and aside from that, I think that um, solely non-commercial is just sort of a fuzzy term that may be unclear for a lot of consumers who want to unlock their phones for financial reasons. Why is permitting someone who owns the, the, the cell phone to sell it to somebody else, the kind of core copyright related interest that we need to be concerned about here. It, it strikes me as being a real stretch in terms of the kinds of things we typically looked at. Maybe that doesn't mean it's illegitimate, but I think you've got a burden to explain to us why we need to care about that. Sure, I, I think <clears> that, I mean, I think that, I would, I would almost flip that question the other way and say, why is making the distinction part of the core copyright? That, that distinction is just not part of the core copyright concern there. If, if unlocking the device is a non-infringing use, then it is a non-infringing use, regardless of what, of what the, the motive is for engaging in that non-infringing use. Well, maybe you could help me by going through the four statutory factors in section 1201A1C and explain to me how those factors militate in favor of permitting, uh, of, of widening the exemption to permit, permit someone to resell it, uh, to, to unlock purely for purposes of resale. Because it's, it's, it's clearly not enough to say the use is not infringing. We then have to look at the factors. So, we start with the first factor and discuss the availability of, uh, the availability for the use of copyrighted works. Um, clearly, uh, encouraging a robust second-hand market for mobile devices is something that um, encourages more widespread availability of these copyrighted works. And that includes the availability for use of the works for all types of purposes, including nonprofit, archival, preservation, and educational purposes, particularly given the fact that nonprofit and low income purchasers of devices may need low cost devices, which they're more likely to find in a robust second hand market. Um, now, I think we. We didn't, we didn't talk about the impact that the prohibition on the circumvention um, would have on criticism, comment, news, recording, teaching, scholarship, or research, because I think that that's just not a particularly uh, salient factor with respect to this particular class. Um, but And then with respect to the effect of the circumvention of techno technological measure on the market for a value of copyrighted works, uh, I just, I just don't think that there's any evidence that this will have an, an, an impact on the market for or value of mobile device computer programs. Um, mobile device manufacturers will continue to develop and innovate new devices for those consumers in the marketplace who wish to purchase new devices, and they will continue to develop firmware and software to be installed in those devices and to, to operate those devices for sale in the first time. Bruce, you want to make any response? Well, first of all, as to the last point, the greatest example of innovation in the market for cell phone operating systems and cell phones came out of the iPhone example, I believe, which was an exclusive AT&T device. It was an exclusive AT&T device. AT&T invested enormous
similar language in other contexts, it has tended not to look at um, the dissemination of those works, but rather the creation of those works, and to the extent that the ability to foster an investment in those works stimulates. There has been a lot of reporting on this, and we argue this oftentimes, that uh, the iPhone, I, I, I don't think it's clear to, or accurate to say that a, the AT&T invested in the iPhone. I think it's the reverse. Apple invested in the iPhone, and they did market it to other carriers, and they were pretty much forced into an exclusive. So I, I, think, I think the innovation came from Apple, per se, not necessarily the carrier. First question is, which came first, uh, the, the iPhone or AT&T's investment in the iPhone? I think you needed both, and to make the iPhone successful, there was a great deal that AT&T had to do, and it's detailed in our comments, and that was necessary to make it a successful release. That's what we'll correct on that. Um, Stephen, I think the last thing you said, it was with respect to the alternative language suggested by CTIA, was that the burden is on someone who wants to propose something different to explain why you need that something different. So let me just put to the three of you, the first question, has the existing class that was announced a couple of years ago, has that, um, has that been too narrow such that non-infringing uses that people should have been able to engage in have not been engaged in because the exemption was not sufficiently broad? I'm not aware uh, of, of that particular trend. Uh, our suggestion to change um, some of the definitions uh, go more to the to the how the industry is viewing these devices. Uh, back to Mr. Kasonic's uh, suggestion, I, I think I, I finally you know understand a little more what you're saying. That uh, and, and to Mr. Gallant, if you have a device that you have an app that is downloaded, Google provides an app that downloads and make that makes that device look, act, feel, and and, and respond like a telephone, i.e. A, a wireless device that, that, that can make phone calls. What would you call? It? Would you? And I'm I'm suggesting it's a wireless device, and that's where the industry is going in terms of its description of. of uh, the devices that are on networks, and um, and that would be more appropriate, so that there is not a confusion and there's not uh, efforts to frustrate the full use and benefit of of uh, your exemption that you've uh, uh, most graciously uh, provided for a number of years. Anyone else have anything to add? Right. I, I would just I would just echo uh, what Mr. Barry said and, and say that. Most of the language changes that we recommended were for the purpose of clarifying the, uh, the application of this exemption and for making it simpler for the average consumer to understand. But we do not have specific evidence of particular uh, cases at this point in time um, of the individual consumers who, in the, in the term of the, the current exemption, have uh, failed to take advantage of the exemption because of some difference in thing I wanted to go back to for a second was the one change that's occurred over really seemingly significantly over the last three years is the availability of unlocked phones. Um, and what I notice in what we mean by an unlocked phone may be less clear. Um, and in particular, I wanted to just uh, go back to some evidence that was uh, introduced in consumer unions reply comments that looked like mostly related to the iPhone 4S, but um, that has, that when a consumer purchases an unlocked phone from Verizon, Sprint, at and um, those uh, are not really unlocked. So can you talk about that at least in that context? Uh, the 
uh, it sounds like only a phone purchased directly, an iPhone pur purchased directly from Apple is fully unlocked. But can you e describe or uh, expand on that a little, just to understand, for our understanding of what an unlocked phone is in this context? I, I actually believe that an iPhone purchased directly from Apple unlocked is not far as the, the CDMA um, chipset is disabled, I believe. Um, however, that, that could have changed, like I said, in the last couple of months. Um, but for example, with with the Sprint policy, just looking for a moment to the Sprint policy, Sprint will unlock the micro SIM slot on its iPhone 4S for consumers who wish to travel internationally. But that SIM slot will still only accept an international SIM card. It won't accept a SIM card from a domestic carrier such as at and And so that's, that's where they're calling it unlocking, but it's not completely unlocked. But that's not the case with the, although there may be some limitations for uh, iPhone purchase from Apple, that there is more uh, more interoperability or, or use of that device and well, unlocked. I believe that I believe that a, a, an iPhone purchased directly from Apple unlocked can be used to connect to um, any GSM network, any so that that you can use it to connect on multiple to multiple carriers that are domestic. Uh, however, although the phone also has the necessary hardware built in to connect to CDMA networks, such as Verizon, um, that chipset is disabled even though the phone is part of that. Um, I'm just going to go ahead along with what Rob is saying. I found this article just this morning from Twice, this week in Consumer Electronics, it says iPhone goes prepaid through Cricket. You know, Cricket was one of the proponents from three years ago. It says Cricket Communications will become the first prepaid service carrier to offer the iPhone beginning June the 22nd when it offers both the iPhone S and iPhone 4 with its current $55 a month plan. And it says iPhone 4S will be available for $499 for the 6 gigabit model and the 8 gigabit model for the iPhone 4 will be $399. So again, this is a ongoing issue. I don't have any answers. I don't have any comments. I'm just saying that the iPhone issue prepaid is something that I think you all should be um, thinking about as we go forward with this because I don't know from this article here whether or not if I'm paying Cricket $4.99 for this, whether or not that's locked or unlocked, even though it's prepaid. So Rob's question is salient even to this day to this particular report. Before I give um, Bruce an opportunity to, to uh, have express his views on this issue, I just want to find out, is is the, when we're talking about unlocked phones and this problem that we see with, or has been alleged with the, uh, with the iPhone, is that uh, true for other types of phones, or is this something <clears throat> where an unlocked phone is not really or not fully unlocked uh, an issue just for the iPhone? I think the short answer is that we're not sure. Um, so the, you know, AT&T policy says iPhones and certain other devices, quote, um, are not eligible to be unlocked. So I think it, it may be, but without going device to, with, without going to AT&T device by device, it's impossible to tell. Bruce? First of all,
before we conclude, just a word about the record and what's next. Uh, essentially, the record is what it is. We're at a pretty, uh, pretty advanced stage in this process now, so we do not, as a general proposition, intend to start taking in more evidence or more argument. Uh, it has been traditional, and it may or may not be the case this time around, that following the hearing and perhaps after we've taken a look at the transcripts, we, there may be some ambiguities we need clarification on, there may be some facts that we think are really important to know that we'll ask for some additional information on, or we may not. Um, because, quite frankly, the time for presenting evidence is, 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 is in the past. So it's only if there was just something that we're confronting and we really can't figure it out and we need to figure it out in order to make a decision that we'll be asking you uh, either for more argument or for more facts. So you may or may not hear from us. If you don't hear from us, please don't. <laughs> please don't speak to us because we really, we've got to start figuring out where we're going with this and, and uh, we have a process. We're trying to stick to that process. Um, with that in mind, I'm happy to say it's noon, so everyone can go out to lunch and uh, not be bothered with us anymore today. And for those of you who are real masochists, we'll see you here at 9 a.m. on Monday. <laughs> Thank you.